Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to the Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium fifth in a series of webinars on the prescriptive online supply chain risk and resiliency 90 day action, to, action plan tool taking less than 30 minutes of your leader's times to build a tailored action plan aligned to your business needs. And today we'll be actually reviewing some of the results of some of our, uh, of our clients and their business and, and look at their action plans. So we appreciate that you're joining us to attend today's webinar on building an evolving resilient enterprise. We hope your family are healthy and safe. This is the fifth webinar on creating and to drive the supply chain 90 day action plan. We look forward to an interactive session consisting of audience polling questions. So please have your cell phone handy to open up on another window and on your browser and log in to Poll Everywhere website, pollev.com forward slash Greg Schlegel 910. My name is Jim DeVries and uh, I'm the founder of Enhanced International Group and a partner of Greg at the Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium and I will be the host of today's webinar. We also have from Uphaven, uh, Jenny and Claire, so welcome. They'll be helping us uh, throughout the webinar. So please have your uh, cell phone handy and enter into the chat or Q&A any questions you have. We'll answer them as best we can throughout the webinar. Joining me and is Greg Schlegel, and he will share his vast experience. Greg is the original founder of Supply Chain Risk and Resiliency and the former president of Apex, ASCM. So Greg, a few words of introduction. You bet, Jim. Thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, joining us and chatting about our passion, uh, Supply Chain Risk and Resiliency. Uh, Jim is correct. Uh, I'm the founder, we're about 12 years old. We'll talk a little bit more about the consortium in a minute, but uh, I've been teaching supply chain risk and resiliency for 10 years at Lehigh University. And I also teach ERM, which we're not gonna talk about today, enterprise risk management at uh, Villanova, go cats, because it's <laughs> March madness basketball and we're still in the mix. So yeah. uh, a little plug there for the cats, all right? Uh, I spent eight years as a, a supply chain executive consultant with IBM across multiple uh, industry sectors. I'm a 35-year supply chain practitioner for a couple of Fortune 100s. I've taught at six different universities here in the States. And as Jim said, uh, I'm kind of a lifelong member of Apex, uh, now ASCM. I uh, ended up being the president in the late 90s, so I have an affinity for supply chain professionals. Back to you, Jim. Thanks, Greg. And with this, actually, I'm going to go right back to you, Greg, and uh, on the overview. Yeah, we said we'd give you a thumbnail sketch. Just if you haven't spent any time with us in this series, uh, on the right-hand side uh, are the uh, members of the consortium. I think we're about 30 strong at the moment. That's about 1,700 supply chain risk professionals around the globe. Uh, these folks bring tools, techniques, skills, methodologies, even software solutions, as you can see, all in an effort to help us identify, assess, mitigate, and manage supply chain risks and support our vision from our book. Book is doing well. Over on the left-hand side, it's pretty much what we provide. Online education, we got two online courses right now that culminate in certificates. We do virtual training like this. We do maybe, what, Jim, five, four or five a month for the last 20 months. We mm -hmm. used to do classroom training. Remember that face-to-face? -face? As an educator, we certainly mm -hmm. hope that begins to grow back. Uh, we provide certificates, risk awareness, mitigation, resiliency, best practices. We coach companies on their journey. We build supply chain risk war rooms. We bring some uh, so software as a solution to do the heavy lifting for SCRNR. And we're very excited now. We have two new online 
risk assessments. One is supply chain management readiness, which measure, measures your supply chain maturity. And the other one is a prescriptive online 90-day action plan, which we're going to focus on today. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Jim. Thanks, Greg. And enhanced, the Enhanced International Group uh, is an exchange of passionate experts to guide you your transformation uh, for self-generating and self-funding results. We have over 50 consultants, consulting companies, and SaaS providers that provide thought leadership focused on enabling your enterprise. Uh, EIG serves as that master integrator to provide you access to the best and brightest companies. We're like a Swiss army knife, many have said, and our goal of the team is to empower your organization's workforce by leveraging EIG's partnered, tenured thought leadership experience, expertise. Our goal is to meet and exceed your expectations with customized, predictable, sustainable, and repeatable 90-day self-funding programs like the 90-day action plan. Uh, just reviewing this slide a bit and uh, describing the supply chain risk and resiliency, we're going to start by looking to recognize that the supply chain is really an ecosystem. And we all heard the saying that we're only as strong as our weakest link. So this kind of personifies that. We look, we, we take it a step further by following strategy uh, an analogy of a, ba a bicycle, the dry pedal wheel representing the strategy, how to target uh, uh, you in the direction that you want to go. And it's pretty important that you know where you want to go. And, uh, and the, the pedal, of course, is one pedal results in many rotations of execution to get you on your way in the right direction. Therefore, uh, the drive chain are the tactics that keep you in the momentum to where you want to go and setting out to go. So in, in essence is if you don't have the tactics, you can have a good strategy, but if you don't have the tactics to get you there, then your execution is not going to work. And what we see is a lot of companies have a strategy, but they're not linked to what they're doing on the execution side. So and supply chain risk management and, and a lot of other things that we work on is helping you on your way there. And Al Albert Einstein, of course, we all dearly love. Uh, life is like a bicycle. To keep your balance, you need to keep on moving. So let's get moving on this webinar series. So here, we're on the fifth webinar and our sixth webinar is making supply chain risk management a priority to your company. So that's more of a sales and that will complete our series. With that, Greg will give us an overview. Greg. You bet. Before we get into the elements of the 90-day uh, SCRNR tool, we wanted to share this uh, strategic game plan with you real quick. On the left-hand side of the graph, the y-axis, we have the basic threads, our point of view, of a multi-year journey. Take a look from bottom to top knowledge, then leadership buy-in, then some tools, then some methodologies, and then some uh, enterprise frameworks. And on the x-axis, we have basically the duration of half of the journey. I say that, half of the journey. Basically, this picture profile uh, shows you uh, foundational uh, visibility, and predictability. And as you can see on the top right, there are two other stages of the five-state maturity model, resiliency and sustainability. And we're, we're going to profile uh, the maturity model for you in a minute. But the graph profiles potential tools, techniques, and methodologies you can leverage during your supply chain risk and resiliency journal. Just wanted to, just wanted to share that with you. And back to Jim. Thanks, Greg. And with that, we'll just go over the 90-day action plan approach that we have. And it consists of 90 questions uh, taking about 25 minutes and giving you that 90-day action plan uh, approach. And, and it, it is an investment of time. And over three months, we'll walk you through the coaching 
through virtual onboarding, collaboration. And again, this is Greg said, this was come about because we, you know, the lack of ability to, to uh, meet you face to face. But it what's turned into is works quite well to get us kicked off, kick started in getting you either started on your journey or continuing down the road that you've already started. And it's all about the right tool in the right place. And so we start with where are you with the maturity model, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, risk appetite, who you are, how do you operate is the next one. And the last one is our 90 day action plan. So the designated lead uh, onboarding call to kick us off, that's how we get started. Then there's a minimum of five to eight stakeholders to complete the surveys. We have up to 10 to 13 stakeholders, uh, generally at a divisional level. And then we, we kick it off with the 90 day action plan report, taking culminating all that information into that report. And then we start having those checkpoint calls to make sure that we're on track in those 90 days. So we'll have it the first one. And then the second one is, are the recommendations that we have, the actions that we recommend working, and then a pulse check and what's next. Of course, there's coaching throughout this. These are just the highlights of the program. And so that brings us to the survey question. And uh, we ask you to enter in uh, rank and order. So we have to look in the chat that, that uh, other is coming out number one. Uh, but uh, we'll keep this open for the next uh, few minutes as we look to see uh, what other uh, things that you would like to talk about, which, which of the uh, uh, air industries, and we'll be doing a case study on, on that. So, uh, Greg, any comments on what you see here? <laughs> Well, if it's not uh, obvious to the attendees, we, we, we picked, I think, five specific uh, industry sectors that we have had experience in terms of clients uh, going through the, the process. We'd love to talk about uh, we'd love to talk about every single, what, 35 different industry sectors that are meaningful to you, but we really don't have uh, 35 different industry sector uh, respondents yet. So uh, we've, uh, we've picked five, and I'm not sure how we're going to handle the other, uh, but uh, you see basically five uh, types of industry sectors that we do have case studies that were allowed to write up caselets, that's what we have. So it's kind of a fixed environment at the moment. So again, the, uh, as, we, as we move through these next few slides, uh, please continue to answer this polling question and we'll come back and look at it before we get to that part of the uh, presentation. Uh -huh. So with that, Greg, uh, the agenda. You bet. Uh, agenda looks like this, folks. We'll try to get you grounded a little bit and talk about why investing in supply chain risk and resiliency uh, pays off. Then we'll uh, dig into the development of your SCRNR persona. We'll talk about the three basic elements of the tool, the maturity model, risk appetite, and operational propensity. Then, as Jim said, we thought we would poll the audience to see if we could pick two basic, two out of the five, and then uh, we could focus on uh, two of those five that we have and give you some insight in terms of uh, clients from those two industries, what they've said, what it looks like in terms of real uh, feedback uh, coming out of the, the tool. That's our approach. Next. We'll uh, touch base on some challenges. We'll highlight them, give you some helpful hints, and then we'll talk more about the benefits to be derived. We'll finish up with um, uh, getting started uh, in terms of uh, giving you a few uh, additional helpful hints, and then close with uh, some compelling statistics that we've accumulated over the last couple of years in terms of benefits of 
a good SCRNR program. That's our agenda. All right, we said we'd start with why investing in supply chain risk and resiliency. Let's take a look. We thought we'd start with uh, uh, these findings from McKinsey. Uh, this is a terrific uh, study. They did it back in November of 2020. Uh, the beauty is that McKinsey has deep pockets. They have tremendous research and we, we, they share a lot with us on supply chain risk and resiliency, and they have the depth and the capability to go across many, many uh, industry sectors. This is a profile of what they did a couple of years ago in terms of looking at industry sectors and their exposure to supply chain shocks, all right? And over on the right-hand side of the graph, the y-axis, essentially, this they they profiled the industry overall shock exposure from low on the bottom on the right to to high on the on the top of the right of the graph. So pretty interesting if you can get your hands on this report. And I think over on the left hand side uh, we have the report name. Uh, it's called Why Investing in Supply Chain Resiliency Pays Off. Uh, November 2020, and uh, we wanted to uh, share this quote with you. Uh, they get it, uh, and it's pretty good. The COVID-19 pandemic has once again driven the necessity of managing operational and supply chain risks. It has catapulted these issues to the top of the CEO's agenda, and the unexpected in your supply chain now has to be considered Probable. So we couldn't have said it any better, folks. A great uh, <clears throat> piece of work by McKinsey. It's rather long, very comprehensive by industry sector. That's why we uh, share it with you. All right. Great. You bet. We said we'd uh, move into developing your supply chain risk and resiliency persona. Essentially, what does that involve? It involves insights on our supply chain um, risk maturity model. It involves risk appetite and what we call operational propensity personas. All right. So we're going to talk all day today about developing SCR and our ex execution strategies. And then we're going to uh, basically show you how the 90-day SCR and our action plan does that, and especially share with you uh, action items that come out of the tool automatically. But first, we said we'd share with you, very important model, our SCR and our maturity model. Our book is built around this, our content, our body of knowledge, our online education, we spent a considerable amount of time before the book was published, going through interviews, talking with exemplar companies, and essentially we came up with this five-stage model. I'll be real quick and give you a thumbnail sketch. On the y-axis on the left is essentially your supply chain risk and resiliency maturity from low on the bottom to high on the top. On the x-axis is competitive advantage. On the left from zero, when you start to infinity, all right, as you move up the maturity model. So the four, five stages look something like this. On the bottom left is foundational. What does that mean? Basically, that's education and becoming aware. Many of us don't have the education, don't know that there are best practices out there to identify, assess, mitigate, and manage. That's kind of where we are right now. That's what we call foundational, a lot of education, a lot of awareness. Second uh, stage is visibility. What do we mean by that? Visibility of your supply chain upstream to your suppliers, sub tier N downstream to your customers. All right, we think visibility is very important. Not many, many of us don't have good supply chain visibility. We say that because the caveat is what you don't know about your supply chain can and will hurt you. Third stage, predictability. Not necessarily what you might be thinking of right now. 
We call it sense and respond. It's really digitizing your supply chain. You can digitize your supply chain in what we call digital twins. There are models out there now, very pretty easy to digitize a supply chain with all the nodes, all the speeds and feeds. Why would we advocate that? Because when you do that, you can then run scenarios. We call it what if scenario planning. You can run scenarios, perturbate a model, and essentially witness how your supply chain will react to a risk stimulus that hasn't started yet, whether it's supplier-based or demand-based or process-based. Fourth stage is resiliency. This is where you embed all the best practices that you will learn in our courses. You'll learn some today. You embed them in your supply chain daily lives. And then the fifth stage, sustainability. Again, not, not maybe what you're thinking about. It's not go green, even though it is green. Uh, it's how do I sustain this journey and scale it across my enterprise? And then on the bottom, you can see, based on where you are in the maturity model, we superimpose a risk heat map of if you're at foundation and visibility, we, pro we think your supply chain is at risk. As you move up through the stages, essentially you can uh, reduce and mitigate a lot of that inherent risk. Uh, so with that, uh, we wanted to give you a thumbnail sketch. I'll turn it back to Jim. Great, Greg. So thank you again. And uh, just to remind you to uh, please do join the pollev.com, Greg Schlegel 910. It's in the chat window. You can click on that link. It's also in the email invitation that I sent out uh, early this morning. Uh, just click on that link and to participate in the polling. It's really important that we get in your feedback, especially throughout this webinar. It's a very interactive webinar. So for the Next question uh, that we have is, where do you think you are uh, today? The Greg just went through. Are you in the foundational stage? Are you just learning about uh, supply chain risk and resiliency? Are you visible? Or do you have some digitization of your supply chain? Uh, do you have control towers? Do you have some kind of visibility of your end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain from all the way from supplier to customer, how visible is that for you? Uh, at a high level, as Greg, are you doing predictability? Are you predicting things? Uh, are you doing risk scenario planning? And then resiliency, sustainability, or are you not sure? So with that, I'm going to just go ahead and see what uh, a couple of our responses have been. Uh, we have some foundation and visibility folks which is fairly typical of what we have been seeing uh, with our clients is that most of the folks tend to be in that foundational visibility stage. Uh, a few are approaching the predictability, but we really haven't seen too many lately except the exemplars who are at the resiliency and sustainability stages. So uh, please do enter in there. This is uh, all will culminate uh, into um, uh, our exercises that will be coming up. Greg, any thoughts? No, it's uh, again, there's no right or wrong answer, folks. And, yeah. you know, we apologize. We, we kind of gave you a real quick thumbnail sketch. There's many more uh, elements in the definitions, but we wanted to at least give you uh, a sense of each each stage. And so we appreciate you rendering an opinion on such a short notice with, uh, with little, little definitional information. And, and all our webinars are available online. Uh, after this webinar, we'll be sending the slides and we'll be also sending out uh, a link to this webinar for you to uh, look at your leisure in your colleagues. So and we had a webinar on maturity that's also out there and available. And we'll be sending a follow-up email by Monday next week with all those details. With that, I think we just move on to the next one, the risk appetite, Greg. You bet. You bet. This is the second. Uh, the, the maturity model is the first of three 
basic graphs that are computer generated out of the tool. This is the second. We call it risk appetite, uh, operating frontier. I'll give you a quick thumbnail sketch on this one. Over on the Y axis, we have risk tolerance. It's kind of think of it as the maximum degree of uncertainty that a company is willing to accept when making a decision that entails the possibility of a loss or a risk. We call, also call it the risk viewpoint. And, and there are two views on the Y axis. One is you might be what we call risk averse, meaning you try to minimize or totally avoid any risk that can produce a loss. And above that horizontal line is another view when you look at risk and that's risk opportunity, meaning you view risk as an opportunity to exploit and grab that reward perhaps before your nearest competitor. On the x-axis, we have what we call risk decision tactics. These tend to support the four specific ovals that you see, and I'll describe them now. The color codes are, these are only, there's only four in our point of view. We've been in this for four years. We checked this with the pure risk profession, and they said, yeah, there's normally only four types of risk perspectives that companies take when it comes to deciding on risk. We'll just share them with you. On the left, the, uh, the yellow is what we call pragmatists. These are folks who wait till the very last moment to decide on a risk decision. Down the bottom, we have green, the green oval. That's what we call conservators. Those folks are somewhat risk averse. They care about minimizing the loss as opposed to gaining a reward. The blue are what we call managers. These folks do a lot of calculation, algorithms, they have methodologies, they pit a lot of trade-offs, cost benefit and risk reward. Very analytical approach. And then the uh, dark purple, or uh, I'll say mauve, uh, are the maximizers. These are the gamers, folks. These are the folks who accept risk, take a look at the risk and say, wow, that's a that's a big risk, but look at that reward. Let's go get that reward before our nearest competitor does it. So that's a quick picture of the four basic risk perspectives that are resonant in the tool and are produced from the tool. And then you can see the fifth oval, which is potentially your organization. So when you fill in the survey, we retrofit position your oval, your organization. And yes, you can touch, you can see this one is touching several different ovals. You might say, well, can you have two different perspectives in the same company? Yes, you can. So again, this is the second of three graphs that are computer generated out of the tool. Back to you, Jim. So now we go back to the survey, another survey <laughs> question. So we're going to ask you where you think you are. Or just simply say, are you a pr pragmatist or are you a conservator, your manager or a maximizer? Of course, you could be a prag conserve or conserve prag, but just your overall propensity is what we're looking for here. Uh, if you're more pragmatic in your company, as Greg described, are you a conservator in making decisions? Again, this is how you make decisions uh, on risk. Uh, do you manage risk and you try to proactively manage it? Is risk not a, something you can't discuss is the way I always look at it. Are you allowed to talk about risk in the hallways or are you avoiding those risk discussions or taboo? Those are what we're looking for. So if you are allowed to talk about risk and you're trying to manage it, then you're probably a manager of risk. If you try to hide it, or, you know, you're a conservator. I, I look at it this way. And if you avoid risk, any discussion, you know, and you wait to the last possible moment, then you're pragmatic. If you look at risk as a reward, and you are always looking at risk as an opportunity, and that's the culture of your company, uh, you would be a, 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 a maximizer. So it looks like we have at least one conservator in the, uh, in the uh, audience there. Uh, uh, let's see if there's some other responses here. 
looks like we have a manager also in there, but uh, that's fairly typical that people are in those quadrants. Again, there's no right or wrong. We do see trends in industry that some industries will see um, if you're more pre-2000 heavy industries, you tend to be more pragmatic or conservator, especially large organizations. Uh, the companies, the, the newer companies, the high tech companies tend to be managers and maximizers, but it's not always the case. Uh, whether you're a small company, medium sized, uh, large company, um, you know, that also plays, has a big play into it. It's all about how your, your organization, your leadership looks at risk in managing. Greg, any comments? No, oh, other than just there's no right or wrong answer. Thank you for rendering an opinion on, again, such short definitions. Uh, but it, it's, it's, there, there is no typical uh, profile, folks. Uh, uh, when we do workshops with 40 people, we go through this exercise. We actually go through a group exercise because we have the time and we poll every single professional in the workshop and it there's no right or wrong answer and essentially there's no trend because every single company is has a different perspective on risk and i'll even go further one one other 30 second little notation when we bring 40 people together in face to face and a company brings four different people from four different departments, you know they all sit together. And when we go through this exercise, many of them are laughing hysterically. Why? Because they're in the same supply chain group and they have totally diametrically opposed risk perspectives uh, than from each other. It, it's It's comical, but it's also fascinating because risk is emotion. It's guttural. You know, it's different than supply chain performance. So there is no right or wrong answer. Thanks for sharing your opinion with us. Thanks, Greg. So the last one, the last graph that we have is what we call operational propensity. And uh, in this one, we're looking at the axes represent the heartbeats the internal cadences, why the quadrants represent what we call the personas of, of the operational propensity. So as we move around the, the uh, axis, we'll look start, start here and we'll start at bureaucratic and it, more of a hierarchical type of organization. If you score high in this, that means from zero to 10, you're more and more bureaucratic. Uh, and again, there's no right or wrong here. You tend to be controlling or orientation, slow speed and efficient stability and control. So that's that type of an organization. Uh, the uh, Moving to the left here is the trapped, which is more clannish. And generally uh, private companies tend to be more like this, but you can have this occur in any company. It's just uh, what, what, how that leader runs that division. And, uh, you know, it's considered, you know, weak agility and collaborations and weak agility, but on the collaborate, but more collaborative uh, type of environment. So very collaborative, but weak on agility here, as we see. Then if we move down to here, an agile uh, company, it'd be strong agility, obviously, and has a broad external focus on differentiation. And then there's a startup company where you're uh, narrow on external focus and, and differentiation. So you, you know, most startups, they're very, very focused. Let's get it going. Speed index, very, very fast. Let's make it happen very, very fast. So we always ask, what's the shape of your kite? And, and or what's the long uh, pole in the tent? And in this particular example, we see that Agile is the long pole in the tent, that this particular company is very strong and agile, and equally uh, the next uh, propensities are startup and trapped and not very bureaucratic at all. 
And so that's a single tail kite, but you could have a two tail kite where we've seen uh, many companies where there's uh, a large corporation where it's mainly bureaucratic, but it may have startup tendencies. So you almost see an equal bureaucratic and startup. And that's very typical of large conglomerate companies that have startup divisions. And so uh, we always ask these questions on how, how, what is the shape of your kite? How do you operate? Again, there's no right or wrong. This just gives you your operational propensity to absorb and, and, and manage change throughout. So with that, and I should note there that this is based on uh, Kim uh, Cameron and Robert Quinn's work. It would be remiss not to note their fantastic work. We have adopted uh, a lot of what they've said but we've also made a, a bit of changes, but this is based on their excellent work that's well noted and uh, accepted throughout the community. So with that, we have our last, uh, not the last one, but our next uh, question is, how do you think you operate? Are you more bureaucratic? We're just asking for a single answer here. Are you more trapped, clannish, meaning you're more, um, uh, in that in that realm, or are you more agile, uh, or are you a startup kind of a company? So, what's your single most uh, largest uh, propensity? Again, there's no right or wrong here. Uh, it's just who you are, because this is how you will manage change throughout your organization. So, when we're looking to um, uh, looking at the way that uh, your, your, what we'll kind of call the overall persona is created, we, we will have that to note. So it looks like we have a lot of, or both, both of the responses. So the responses show bureaucratic and hierarchical. So I, if I remember, if I go back, we had visibility on the first one. On the second one, Greg, what was the predominant one? Oh, uh, boy, good question. I think there were two of them, but uh, uh, one was a, a manager or conservator, I thought. I, I, conservator? I can't recall okay. exactly. And in this next one, we have bureaucratic. We also have some agile folks there, which is great. Thanks for your participation. That's uh, very uh, enlightening. So with that, uh, what we do is we, we say, okay, so if you're Visibility, conservator, and and bureaucratic is what I heard. So that's that's the that is the uh, persona. So when you go through all the different combinations, you would end up with eighty eight. And we, what we try to put on on this page are what we found as the most common ones. And so we see visibility, conservative, bureaucratic, or Agile. These were two of the two of the different uh, ones that we had. So from there, from there, we will then look to see what is the best action plan for that company that is in that area, depending on your industry and so forth. Other parameters also, but we mainly look at this, and we found that you know through our. Uh, different clients that it pretty much aligns to how they think, who they are, you know, where they're at in maturity, who they are, and how do they operate. So when we put together an action plan, it's doable for them and it, it's meaningful for them. So I think we're going to skip this next um, exercise and we're going to just move right on into the value proposition, Greg. Yeah, well, um, now we've shared with you the three types of graphs that are computer generated out of the uh, survey. Uh, and what we just wanna do is finish up this section with uh, uh, a bit of the value prop as we see it. A couple of ugly duckling data for you as well in terms of why would you want to get engaged in an SCR in our journey? So let's take a look. From a corporate transformation, here's what we hear from McKinsey, all right? You as a corporation can expect a significant supply chain risk event equating to about 42% of 
of one year's EBITDA. Now, many organizations and industry sectors use EBITDA. It's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Many of the industries, I'm an old chemical industry guy, many chemical, many pharmaceutical, a lot of industries are using EBIT and EBITDA as good, effective measures of their effectiveness to the bottom line. So 42% of one year's EBITDA, think of that. Could you survive a supply chain risk event like that? Another value prop is it provides building blocks for you to survive and thrive the risks that are in what we call the VUCA world. We all live in VUCA world, folks. That's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's here in front of us right now in our global supply chains. Uh, SCRNR also provides coaching. To, we provide coaching to achieve supply chain risk management goals. And then from a business unit point of view, here's another ugly duckling piece of data that we uh, believe in and have seen time and time again. You know, there, there probably will be about 11 to 12 disruptions for your company, no matter who you are, no matter what you make. There's probably a disruption once a month over a 12 month period. Those disruptions have been codified and captured uh, to the point of each disruption is about 350,000 US dollars. You can do the math, it comes out to about three to $4 billion where you are gonna have to find that kind of money out of your treasury to mitigate those 11 or 12 risks. That's not chump change, that's real money. All right, so we, we share that with you. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that, but uh, it's kind of across the, uh, the industry sectors. And then what we do is we give you, uh, the tool gives you actionable activities based on vetted research, our body of knowledge, benchmarking, uh, and uh, essentially the AI and ML algorithms inside the tool. So we just wanted to give you a sense of some <laughs> recent data out there, the impacts, and also what, uh, what the value prop uh, can be for an SCRNR journey. Okay, and I think we move into, here's the ad hoc. <laughs> here's the ad hoc. We have five basic case studies of companies who have gone through this tool and have provided feedback. And we, we thought, okay, based on your decision on the graph, the polling question, we would attempt to take two of the top frequency uh, industries. That, that was our thought. Jim? Yeah. So uh, at the beginning of the webinar, we asked you to uh, answer this polling question. And um, sorry about this. Just have some technical <laughs> issues. And I think we came out with CPG and electronics are the top two. Uh, so okay. those are the top two. Um, Good. So we start with CPG. Great. Go yeah, ahead. Go sure. ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, again, these are companies within these industry sectors that have gone through the survey. Uh, and it's more than one person. We'll talk more about the give and the get. Uh, but these are actual results from a company's survey uh, coming out of the tool. On the left is the uh, maturity. You see the five-stage model. Uh, the, um, the yellow icon or the orange icon uh, obviously is the, oh, well, it's the as-is position. We ask two types of questions on the maturity. We ask, where do you think you are? Just like we did with you. Uh, and we add up all those, take a look at it, let it go through the algorithms. And we attempt to position the company. And this company tends to be on the early stages of visibility. And we ask a second question. Where, do you, where would you like to be? What's your future horizon? What are you thinking? And that is the black icon. So this company said, yep, we think we're in the beginning of visibility and we'd like to get through that, uh, that stage. 
And so what did they say to us? You know, we've been at this for about three years. We're still at the beginning. Yes, you are. We're a global company, 200 countries. You know, that's a pretty expansive supply chain. We are also a small startup company. So they have obviously different divisions that have different perspectives. Uh, we're looking, we're not looking past the visibility stage and that's fine. There's no right or wrong answer there. That's who they are and where they are. Middle of uh, the graph is risk appetite. All right, there are the four uh, ovals again and we position this organization uh, in this area, touching several different uh, perspectives. What did they say to us? Uh, we are pragma pragmatists and conservators. We're kind of risk averse in making decisions. This is them telling us once they see the graph, we are who we are. And with our change in leadership, we expect that will probably not change. All right, in terms of their risk appetite, we are trying to move to be, uh, we are moving to be more risk averse. Okay, no right or wrong answer there. We are reactionary, they told us that. We wait till the last minute to make a decision. Uh, and there's a sense uh, that uh, the group wants to change, but change is hard. And over on the right-hand side, we have the operational propensity or what's the, uh, what's the configuration of your kite? Um, as you can see, it's got a couple of uh, multiple long poles. They said, well, yeah, we are very bureaucratic and slow to make a change. This is them telling us our data is siloed, which makes it difficult to share information across departments. We are a startup as well. All right. And we're, we, some of those divisions are, think they're pretty agile. And when, when we have a problem, we go solve it. So they have multiple perspectives because they have multiple divisions because they're so large. So we wanted to give you a profile of a CPG company's user uh, feedback. And then this is their persona. They're invisibility. They're pride conservative. They're pretty much bureaucratic and a little bit of a startup. So we call them a double tail kite. All right, that's fine. And then here are some of the action items that the tool provided them after they filled in the survey. Uh, there were six of them, action items, pretty much. Number one, maybe you want to identify all existing and possible risks for a particular supply chain. We always talk about start small. Don't try to do it with your 6,000 suppliers. That take a small product line and start there. Maybe you want to map that supply chain. Take a small number of stock keeping units and go uh, from customer to supplier and visually map out that supply chain. We don't care if you do it manually. We do it a lot of times with our clients manually through an exercise to get them grounded. Uh, uh, you could digitize it as well if you're of that persuasion. Third one, identify key suppliers from that mapping exercise and maybe you calculate their Altman Z-score. We'll talk about Altman Z-score at the end it's a bankruptcy predictor and it's free. Number four, maybe you want to secure a sponsor for funding to move the journey forward. And we would advocate you pick a supply chain risk and resiliency lead. Number five, begin to assess your identified and prioritized risks. There are methodologies in the body of knowledge where you can assess risks because not all risks are the same. And then finally, number six, Maybe you want to investigate integrating a risk alert system with your existing solutions because visibility is key. What you don't know about your supply chain can and will hurt you. There are tools out there that scan the globe, scan social media every hour and produce risk alerts and will provide those risk alerts to you and your team to make sure that a risk alert uh, might impact might impact one of your nodes in your supply chain. That's pretty much a, uh, a, uh, a persona and an action item for this particular CPG company. So we are coming up uh, 10 minutes to the hour. So we respect your time. So if you have questions, uh, please do enter it in the chat or send us an email. We'll be more than glad to follow up with that. We're going to wrap it up.
mm-hmm. at a high level and identify some of your challenges that we've seen out there, some hints and benefits. So challenge of getting started, company vision. Um, this supply chain risk and resiliency needs to be aligned to where your company's going. So what is your company vision and folding it in? The leadership of needs to be bought in. This uh, does involve uh, your leadership. Uh, that sometimes takes some time with some of our clients to get started. They wanted to do it in a small part of the company or maybe just in the supply chain, not understanding that it is an organizational, uh, uh, something from an organizational perspective that you need to address uh, across the leadership team. And so that alignment across the organization is very, very important. Of course, then that sponsorship all all in all. And then what's your risk appetite and operational propensity will really say where, you know, how fast you can go and how do you view risks that will also dictate the speed and the complexion of these, of these different uh, action items that we have mentioned just recently. And of course, you know, as far as helpful hints, the communication, 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 Mm -hmm. uh, if you hold things close to your vest, it makes it difficult. So we really need to communicate across the organization that we're doing this education and coming up with a language of supply chain risk and resiliency, what it is and getting everybody on the same page, speaking the same language is incredibly important. And in line with that is the awareness of making sure that everybody in the organization can at least spell supply chain risk and resiliency our use of the terms and some of the founding principles. And this needs to be a burning platform. So it, it, it helps tremendously if you have a, a burning platform, if the leadership is driving this uh, without that leadership driven, uh, without that leadership drive, it makes it very difficult to deploy just like any other program in an organization. And so we want to align that with the corporate division and goals of your organization. So they should be supporting your other goals. And again, as far as the personas, just be careful not to, uh, you know, uh, change your persona or look to say, oh, I don't like our persona. It is what it is. There's no good Mm -hmm. or bad. Just embrace it, Uh, self-effacing. And uh, don't be concerned if your company has multiple personas. Uh, so especially if it comes very complex, so you have different types of uh, divisions, uh, make sure that you operate, you know, or perform this assessment by division um, because you're, there's many companies where different divisions, they have different cadences, different product lines, different customer base. Uh, for each of those, you need to probably run this, uh, uh, run a different assessment. Um the, uh, of course, whoever's leading this effort for you needs to understand all these things that we just discussed. And, uh, and they have to understand those different personas across the different divisions across the company on how to make this work and manage expectations. And we all know the culture eats strategy for breakfast. So that'll link your speed of execution to a line across your organization. And managing your personas, of course, is essential to the success of your SCNRR. Uh, journey. So with that, uh, Greg? You bet. We'll finish strong here and uh, talk about uh, getting you started. Uh, We don't need to go over this again, Jim. This is the process. We want to get into the ask. All right. What do we ask of you? If you get engaged with us, we ask normally five to eight executives from your company fill out the 90 questions. Uh, We ask that the executives be department heads or what you call discipline managers, but uh, across the supply chain, including sales and finance. uh, And the executives, we always ask, be from the same division or product line because we advocate start small, all right, as a proof of concept. Next. Uh, The survey discipline coverage, again, we ask for multiple types of perspectives. You can take a look at uh, the different types of folks who tend to essentially uh, answer the survey. Uh, That profile is kind of an ideal 
uh, profile from a manufacturing company point of view, we would advocate the more the merrier because we are looking for different perspectives and then we'll harmonize those different perspectives. So if you do that, what do you get? Well, you get a sense of where you are. We, we position you on the maturity model. You get a sense of who you are relative to your risk appetite. You saw that as a second graph. You get a third graph, and essentially that is a sense of how you operate. Again, no right or wrong answer. That's your operator operating propensity. And then you get an aligned 90-day action plan based on everything above and the algorithms and the body of knowledge. All that is in the tool. And we attempt to give you a workable set of action items to either get you started or, as Jim said early, move you forward and be successful with those five to seven action items. You learn how to identify, assess, mitigate, and manage during the process. And essentially, you basically get a strategic advantage to the bottom line. And there's a bonus. For every organization, that provides five or more executives to fill in the survey, the consortium will offer that company one free pass to our supply chain risk and resiliency online course. It's self-paced. You can take a, a full year to finish it. It's got all the body and knowledge. It's essentially the book online with a host of different quizzes and so forth culminating in a certificate from the consortium. It's a value, folks, of 1400 US dollars. So with that, we'll uh, close our discussion with some benefits of an SCRNR program. Let's take a look. One is cost reduction and a robust R uh, supply chain risk and resiliency program can provide you because we've witnessed this these uh, data points with clients, workshop attendees, and so forth, cost reduction. If you get good at risk and resiliency, you can reduce your insurance premiums anywhere from 10% or more. We've witnessed this with clients because you're mitigating your risk to your organization. Automated workflow increases more than 10%. That's for better risk management. That produces, that says you produce a quality, repeatable process associated with, digit, with uh, risk management. There's cost avoidance associated with good SCRNR. Having the ability to be effective in risk detection and assessment, the statistics coming out of some of the research is. Exemplars are 17% or more, more effective because speed is life in risk. If you can identify, assess, and mitigate a risk faster than your nearest competitor, that's a strategic advantage. Then there's cost avoidance. As you get better and better associated with managing risk, you can reduce the cost associated with managing risk. That's cost avoidance. Working capital is increased. Good SCRNR produces better, more free cash. The exemplars say we have a 94% cash flow forecasting accuracy. That's 13% higher than the average. That's best in class. Why? Because you're getting better at mitigating risks and avoiding risks and disruptions in your company. That tends to free up cash flows and cash is king in cash is a red line item. Cash is king in a crisis. If you can increase your free cash anywhere from 10 to 30 percent as you move on this journey, that is real money. Cash conversion cycle. Uh, we're kind of running out of runway here. We advocate using cash conversion cycle. Uh, it's, a, it's a good measure of both supply chain performance and risk mitigation. You can find it on Wikipedia. It's real easy. It's inventory plus receivables minus payables. And essentially we said we talk about the Altman Z-score. Z that's, um, that's a bankruptcy predictor folks with 95, 90% accuracy being able to predict bankruptcy for a company 
12 to 15 months into the future. Who wouldn't want that for their key suppliers? Who wouldn't want that 12 to 15 months ahead of time? All right. Why would we advocate this? Because we've found out that changing a key supplier will cost you anywhere from one to three million US dollars per changeup. So our final thought to you is on SCRNR, think big, start small, act fast. Back to you, Jim. Thanks, Greg. And we thank everyone for hanging in there uh, for the webinar. Uh, we will have our last webinar in the series of, on April 12th making SCRM a priority for your company, giving you helpful hints to help you sell it to your company. With that, any closing comments, Greg? I'm just thanks a lot for, for the time. We appreciate you uh, engaging in our polling questions. That's always uh, good when we can have the uh, audience uh, understand to a certain extent and engage in, uh, in the uh, resiliency and risk approach. Uh, thanks again for your time. Uh, again, if you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out. And uh, thanks again, and all the best on your journey. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your time today and participation. And we look forward to seeing you future webinars. All the best.